Church fam, I love you and I, I miss you so, so, so much. Um, it's just been a few weeks, but it feels like it's been a few years. Um, but I literally, I just cannot wait to uh, to come back and and be with you guys. But today on Father's Day, I just want to say uh, happy Father's Day to all the dads. Uh, you guys are heroes. You are legendary. One of my favorite quotes is from a guy named Andy Stanley. And he says, your greatest contribution to the kingdom of God may not be something that you do, but rather someone that you raise. And so dads, I just want to challenge you and, and encourage you. Uh, your legacy is not really about the stuff. It's not really about the job. It's not uh, really about how much you make, what you do. Uh, your legacy will, will be right here in, in your kids. Um, and, and we talk a lot about they don't want your presence. They just want your presence. And so uh, dads, I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you. Uh, be present uh, with your kids. One of the greatest things about this sabbatical, uh, I think they may be getting a little bit annoyed with me, uh, is uh, a little bit? A, a little bit annoyed? A lot annoyed with me? Yeah. You can get a little annoyed with me in sabbatical? I play too much golf. I have played a lot of golf. That's that's true. I've played a lot of golf. Uh, but but I've been able to spend a tremendous amount of time with my family, gonna keep spending time with my family, and just moments I will cherish uh, literally the rest of my life. So I love you and I'm grateful for you. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Good morning. Uh, so glad that you are here today. Thanks for being here uh, on this Father's Day. And again, as Pastor Adam said, I want to say happy Father's Day to all you dads. Uh, grateful for you. We love you. Grateful for your sacrifice. Grateful for all that you do for so many. Uh, and I also just want to mention, you know, I know that days like today can be tricky for some uh, because maybe Father's Day is this year is just may maybe more of a day of grief because of a father or father figure that you've recently lost or um, maybe just a, a yearly difficult reminder of the fact that your dad wasn't maybe as present as you as, as he should have been in your life. And I just want you to know wherever you're at today, whatever kind of spot you find yourself in when it comes to Father's Day, I just want you to know you are seen and that we love you. And uh, man, just my prayer is that our heavenly father would be so, so near to you. Uh, today. But, but can we honor and celebrate all of our dads and just thank them for all that they do? Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 1, uh, because that's where we're going to be at today, Mark chapter 1. A couple weeks ago, we finished up our eight-week-long series on the fruit of the Spirit. And then last week, Pastor Travis was in the house and did an incredible job, as he always does. And, and today, you know, in the summer, we don't really do a whole lot of sermon series because we know that people are traveling and there's vacation schedules and a lot of things different going on, but I'm preaching the next three weeks. And so I just, uh, man, I felt like there's some, uh, just kind of a, a three-part kind of conversation that the Lord's been dealing with me on and that I want to talk through over the next few weeks. We're going to talk about a few buzzwords that we hear in the church a lot, but I think sometimes we fail to really understand what they mean. And those words are gospel, discipleship, and mission. So Mark chapter one, I'm going to start reading in verse 14. Are you there? Three of you are. Cool. It's great. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. It says, After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And we thank you for your word today. I pray that you would use your word to transform us, to encourage us, to challenge us to draw us closer to you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Um, so again, obviously it is Father's Day. And you know, I think it's natural for kids growing up um, to kind of consider their, their dad their hero and want to be like their dad in a lot of ways, right? If you grew up and your dad was a fireman, maybe at some point you wanted to be a fireman or your dad was in some sort of business, you wanted to also be in that business. And so for me, people growing up would always ask me, are you going to be a preacher like your dad? And I would always respond with absolutely not. Wanted nothing to do with that. Um, and it has nothing to do with my dad. My dad is my hero. I love my dad. I'm grateful for my dad. There's so much about my dad that I wanted to be like and still want to be like. And nobody cares for the people that he pastors quite like my dad does. And so for me, I didn't want to be a pastor not because of my dad. I didn't want to be a pastor because, no offense, some of you. Right? 
Come on, church people can be the worst sometimes, right? Uh, but when I was 15, man, I felt the Lord kind of leading my heart in that direction and uh, being in ministry as a vocation. And, and I can take you back to that spot, to that moment where I sense the Lord began to work in me in that, that way. And uh, at the corner of Church and State Street in Wagner, Oklahoma, at the Wagner Church of God, man, how God just met me in that space. But really, it's a journey that that began back when I was eight years old. Uh, when I was a kid, I grew up going to this kid's camp in Flint, Michigan. And, and I, when I was eight years old, I don't remember what the camp speaker talked about, um, but I do remember the altar call because it was one of those classic, like super intense altar calls where it's like, if you were to die tonight <laughs> on your way back to your dorm room, where would you spend an eternity? How many of you have ever been in a church service like that? Any of you? Okay, yeah, few, yeah. And uh, I was eight years old. I didn't really know. I just knew I didn't want to go to that like fiery burning place that he was talking about. And so that day I prayed a prayer to ask Jesus to come into my heart. Um, and for the next seven or eight years, I prayed that prayer again and again and again. And how many of you got saved a million times when you were a kid, right? It's like, I want to be sure, right? Because for me, like in my kind of just early journey of faith, uh, Christianity just felt like a bunch of rules to follow. And, and because I couldn't follow all these rules perfectly, I always had a lot of guilt and shame because of that. And, and I, always, I always, every time I was in church, I was praying that prayer of faith because I wanted to be sure that when I died, which could apparently happen on my way back to my dorm room at kids camp, <laughs> I wanted to be sure that I was going to go to heaven and not to hell. And so for me, the biggest thing that I had to learn was that it is not my good deeds that save me, right? It is not my righteous behavior that saves me. It is, there's no amount of right living that I can do in order to make up for my sin. It is only the mercy of God, the goodness of God, the grace of God that saves us and makes us more like Jesus. Come on, are you thankful for God's grace today? Amen? Yeah, amen. But, but I wonder if there's a lot of people who kind of struggle with something a little bit different. That, that for many people, Christianity is not necessarily a bunch of rules to follow. It is simply just some statements to believe. And, and what I mean by that is that as long as you say that you believe the right things, as long as you maybe prayed a prayer at one point in your life, then it doesn't really matter how you live today because you still get to go to heaven when you die. Right, as long as you believe in Jesus, as long as you have a scripture in your Instagram bio, right, as long as you say that you believe the right things, well, how you live doesn't matter because all that matters is getting to heaven when you die. And I think this understanding honestly has led us to what might be the, the biggest issue that the American church is facing today. And that is simply this, is that we have a lot of believers and not enough disciples. We have a lot of people who say that they believe in Jesus and less people who really actually follow the ways of Jesus. And here's what's tricky about that, is when you read the Bible, you don't actually get the sense that Jesus ever makes that distinction. That it's possible to be a believer where you believe in Jesus and yet don't follow him as a disciple of Jesus. If you'll let me nerd out for a second, are there any Mandalorian fans in the room? Only a few of you. Okay, there's only a few nerds at the 11:30. That's okay. We are all here together. And uh and it's this awesome like western set in the Star Wars universe is basically what it is. And uh the the main character, he grew up in in this religious sect called uh Children of the Watch or Death Watch, and they have this saying, this phrase that they say all the time. What is that phrase? This is the way, come on, this is the way. It's just a reminder for their people that they're not called to just believe a certain set of statements, but they're called to actually live a certain way, to follow a way of life. And did you know that early Christians were not called Christians, were not called believers, they were called followers of the way. Acts chapter nine verse one says this, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that he, if he found any there who belonged to the way, 
whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Acts 19, verse 23, about that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. They were followers of the way. Now, the analogy starts to break down a little bit when you consider the fact that Mandalorians are kicked out for like one mistake and followers of Jesus are in by grace. We stay by grace. We are kept by grace. It is all by the grace of God. But the sentiment still rings true. Following Jesus was never meant to be about a set of statements to believe, but about a way of life to practice. How we live today matters tremendously. So, so the question then is where did we go wrong? Which is kind of a weighted question. And I hope over the next couple of weeks we're gonna be able to kind of dissect the issue and look at Jesus' invitation to be his disciple and what it means to be a disciple of Jesus and look at his invitation to join him on mission and what it means to be on mission for Jesus. But, but today I want us to look at what I think might be the root issue here. And that is simply this, that we have a misunderstanding of what the gospel is. Everyone say gospel. Gospel. Okay, so again, the gospel is like this buzzword we hear a lot in church, and sometimes we'll just kind of boil the gospel down to something along the lines of this, that I am a sinner in need of saving, and so Jesus came to earth, died on the cross for my sins, rose again so that I get to go to heaven with him when I die. And, And listen, while that is certainly a part of the gospel, here's where I think we have gotten a little bit off track. This understanding of the gospel makes eternity the only goal for a follower of Jesus. Now, is that the ultimate goal? Of course it's the ultimate goal, right? Pastor Adam reminds us all the time, if it doesn't have eternal significance, it does not matter. But notice that phrase does not call us to ignore how we live today because eternity is all that matters, but to center how we live today around things that matter in eternity. How we live has tremendous importance. And so turning the gospel into this transaction between you and God where you get to punch your ticket into heaven means that as long as you believe the right things or as long as you prayed the right prayer, as long as you make it into heaven, then how you live today has no importance at all. And if there's anything I want us to understand today is this, is the gospel impacts life today, not just life forever. The gospel has incredible implications for the way that we live today. So so the question then is, what is the gospel? And and if it's okay with you, today is gonna feel a little bit more Bible teachery, okay? Next couple weeks, we're gonna get kind of really more practical, some of the implications of this in our lives. And and I hope today is still encouraging and challenging and helpful for you. But if you leave today and you're like, man, I don't know, the preacher wasn't really on his game today. I just feel like something was missing. Come back next week we can continue the, the conversation. But what, what is the gospel? If you still have your Bible open to the first chapter of Mark, if it's that first page of the book of Mark, at the top of that page, you'll probably see this phrase, the gospel according to Mark. And many of you might already know that the gospel, that, that, that word that's translated as gospel can also be translated as good news. So that phrase can be read as the good news according to Mark. And each of the first four books of the New Testament have that same title because they are the gospels. They are the written account of the life and ministry of Jesus and everything contained in those accounts is the gospel. So, Scott McKnight, a theologian, said it this way, the gospels are the gospel. Isn't that profound? (laughs) Right, just deep, fresh revelation from God for you this morning. The gospels are the gospel. Some of you are like, well, duh, of course they are. Like, this is what you come up with after a whole week of study, this is what you've got for us. Like this, this guy's on payroll, like what are we doing right now? Like can Pastor Adam come back from his sabbatical? Like this is, the gospels are the gospel. Of course they are, but listen, let's not skip over the simple things because we have to understand this, that everything, pertaining to the birth of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus, every bit of it is the gospel. And so if everything about Jesus, if the gospel is everything that is about Jesus and is centered all around Jesus, then we have to first go to the gospel that Jesus preached for us to understand what the gospel is, which brings us back to our passage that we read in Mark chapter one, verse 14, says this, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news, also translated as gospel of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. 
Repent and believe the good news. This is the gospel of Jesus. And, and I wanna break this, this up into two different sections, okay? So first there is an announcement. Everyone say announcement. And then there's a response. Everyone say response. So the announcement of the gospel is simply this. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God has come near. Now, kingdom language can be tricky for us because we don't live in a monarchy, right? Uh, so for us, kingdom language just reminds us of TV shows like The Crown or like the royal family drama and Prince Harry and Meghan and all those ridiculous things, right, that, that people follow. Uh, it's entertainment. It is European history. Uh, but, but kingdom language is all throughout the four Gospels. The kingdom of God refers to the rule and reign of God. It's not necessarily a physical kingdom, but the realm in which God rules and reigns is king. It's anywhere where people have submitted to God's way of doing things. It's anywhere where the powers of sin and death are being pushed back, making way for life and healing. It's anywhere where love and justice are being done on the earth. And notice here in this text, Jesus doesn't just say, he doesn't say that the kingdom of God is to come, and he doesn't say that the kingdom of God is where you go when you die. He declares that the kingdom of God has come near. It is here. It has arrived. So the question is then, okay, what does that mean for me though? Like, okay, cool, the kingdom of God is here. That sounds like some theological mumbo jumbo. Like, what are we talking about here? What does that mean for me? The, the first pastor that I worked for, still a mentor of mine to this day, he, uh, when he was 15 years old, he lost his dad to a train car collision. And that event sent him in a downward spiral of drug and alcohol addiction. And in his small town in Texas, there, there are a number of occasions that he got arrested. And because it's a small town, he got arrested by the same police officer. And this police officer in particular, anytime he would arrest him, he would put him in handcuffs, he would put him in his cop car, and then he would talk to him about Jesus on the way to the police station. Like, Edwin, listen, I know that you're hurting. I know that you're struggling. I know that you've lost your dad, but I want you to understand that there is a heavenly father who loves you, who has a plan and a purpose for your life. And there is no mistake that is too big for him to forgive and his grace is bigger than your sin. I mean, he would preach the gospel to him. And, and one day he ended up giving his life to Jesus, had this incredible encounter with God. He went to this program called Teen Challenge, which is a Christ-centered alcohol and drug rehabilitation center. He sensed a call into ministry. Shortly after that, met his wife. He has, to this day, he's been married for around 30 years. They have three adult kids that they have raised and who love the Lord. He pastors an incredible church in Tennessee. He has started and led his own drug and alcohol rehabilitation program where hundreds of men have come through and experienced healing and life transformation and forgiveness and restoration in their marriages and in their family. Why do I say all this? Because this is what it looks like for the kingdom of God to come near. This is what it means when we say that the kingdom of God is here. How else can life transformation like that take place? How else can someone who is on the path of destruction experience hope and restoration in such a way that not only do they experience it in their life, but they're able to extend it to the people around them? It is because God's kingdom is here. That's the announcement of the gospel of Jesus. But I can hear your pushback, okay? There's a little bit of pushback here because some of you might say, well, if God's kingdom is here, then why haven't I experienced my healing yet? Right, if the kingdom of God is here, then why, why did God not restore my marriage when I prayed and asked for him to? Like if the kingdom of God is here, then why are my kids who I raised in church and I raised to love the Lord, why are they living in sin and not living for the Lord today? The kingdom of God is here? I don't know, man. It doesn't feel like it in my life. What do we do with that? And I wanna be clear, there's some theologies out there, some like kingdom now type theologies that say that you can experience this like perfect utopia, heaven on earth, and that if you don't experience the healing of heaven and the blessings of heaven and the prosperity of heaven, it's because you don't have enough faith. And I want you to understand that that is wrong theology. It is harmful theology. But still, what do we do with those cases? Where those instances and those spaces in our life where, where it, the kingdom of God is here, but it doesn't feel like it for us. Theologians call this the already but not yet. 
And it comes from this idea that we see Jesus, like in our passage and many other places, he speaks of the kingdom of God as a present reality. The kingdom of God has come near. But, but then we also see other spaces in scripture where he seems to talk about the kingdom of God as a future reality, that the kingdom of God is yet to come. So it's like, see, I knew the Bible contradicted itself. Which one is it, Jesus? You're confusing us and you're confusing yourself. Is the kingdom of God here or is the kingdom of God yet to come? And the answer is this, yes. It's both. The kingdom of God is here and the kingdom of God is yet to come. And and, and the best way that I've heard this described, and, and if you've been to Wednesday Night Sunday School, you've probably heard me talk about this on a number of occasions, but it's the difference between D-Day and V-E Day. If you're a World War II historian, you know that June 6, 1944 is the day that the United States Armed Forces invaded Normandy. We refer to this day as D-Day. And a lot of people will argue that this was the beginning of the end of World War II, that this was the decisive battle. This is really where the victory was won. But it wasn't until a year later, May 8th, 1945, where we got to celebrate, I say we as if I was there, I wasn't alive in 1945, but we celebrated the war being over on VE Day or Victory in Europe Day. Victory was won and yet it took a year for victory to be fully realized. And this is not a perfect analogy, but it's helpful for me to understand what Jesus means when he says the kingdom of God is here and yet the kingdom of God is to come. It means this, is that victory has been won. The powers of sin and death have been defeated. Jesus has been made king of the world and yet we wait for the day that our king is going to return when sick, and sin and death and disease and injustice and evil will all finally be destroyed. Come on, and we will experience life in God's kingdom forever. And until that day comes, we pray like Jesus called us to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Until that day, we pray and we fight with everything that we have for marriages to be restored, for our lost kids to come home. Until that day, we pray that we might experience just a piece of the healing power of heaven here on earth. And we look forward with eager anticipation for a day that is coming that the kingdom of God will be fully realized. This is the announcement of the gospel today. The kingdom of God has come near. It's here which then leads us into the other part, which is the response. This is the response. In light of the announcement, here's how we're called to respond. Repent and believe. Everyone say repent. Yeah, we talk about repentance a lot. Um, and we talk about the fact that to repent means to make a 180 degree turn. It means that you're heading one way in the way of sin and death, and by the grace of God, you are able to realize the error of your ways to turn and to head towards the way of life and godliness. And, and I want you to consider and think about who Jesus is talking to primarily in this text. He's talking to Israelites. He's talking to the people of God. And if we, we look at their history in the Old Testament, we see time and time again where the people of God turned their backs on the way of God and decided to live life their own way and do their own thing and make their own rules and live according to their own sinful desires. And here's what they found over and over again. Go read the Old Testament. Here's what they found. Their ways don't work very well. They don't work. When, you, when, you, when we rebel against the ways of God and we try to live life our own way, it's the same thing we're discovering today. Our ways don't work. But so often we live as if we know better than God does. Right? Like when, again, when you're a kid, you want to be like your dad, but there's also times you think you know better than your dad does. This is a constant struggle in my house. I'll tell my girls, don't do that. They do that. One of them gets hurt and I'm like, dad knows a thing or two about a thing or two, right? Like, what are we doing? Like, how do you at age eight and six think that you know better than dad does? And I think sometimes God just wants to look at us and be like, how do you tiny human think that you know better than me? I have a way that is so much better for you. And yet we insist on living our own way. And it's not until we repent. We turn from our way of doing things that we'll experience the life and the purpose that God has for us. We have to repent and then we have to believe. Everyone say believe. Now belief in this context is not just about intellectual belief. 
It is to believe something to the extent that you are willing to surrender your life to it, to declare your allegiance to it, to be committed to it. And, and this is important because we know this to be true. You can be convinced of something without being committed to something. You can, you can believe that something is true and yet not live your life as if you believe that thing is true. What, what do I mean? Well, you can believe that eating healthier is better for you, but those nothing bunt cakes, am I right? I mean, incredible. You, you, you can believe that flossing is good for you, but when's the last time you flossed? And some of you are like this morning, okay, overachievers, congratulations. <laughs> You can, you can believe that, that sleep is better for you and yet still watch Netflix until it has the audacity to ask you if you're still watching. It's like, yes, Netflix, I am still watching. Don't judge me. Right. So, so you, can, you can be convinced of something. You can believe that something is true and right and good and noble and yet not allow it to impact the way that you live. But listen to me, Jesus does not give us that option. When Jesus calls us to believe in him, he does not leave any room for us to simply believe that he died on the cross for our sins so we can go to heaven when we die. He calls us and invites us into a way of life. And I'm not preaching a gospel of works. Do not hear me wrong. We are saved by grace and grace alone. But if, your, if the grace of God does not move you, if your faith and your belief does not move you into action and into transforming the way that you live, then something has gone wrong. Repent and believe means that you make this response that says, Jesus, you are my king and I surrender. I repent from my way of doing things and I surrender to your way of doing things. This is the gospel of Jesus. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe. Martin L Luther said it this way, at its briefest, the gospel is a discourse about Christ, that he is the son of God, became man for us, that he died and was raised and that he has been established as Lord over all things. Rich Velotis, pastor and author in Queens, New York, he said, the gospel is the good news, that God's kingdom has come near in Jesus Christ and through his life, death, and resurrection and enthronement, the powers of sin and death no longer have the last word. Another guy said it this way, the gospel is the announcement that God's kingdom has arrived and through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, all are invited to surrender allegiance and to participate in what he's doing. That's actually my summary of the gospel and like when I originally wrote that in my notes, <laughs> I was like, this seems really like weird and pretentious for me to like put my summary of the gospel next to like two other guys who are way smarter than me. And then I also just thought it was kind of funny. So instead of my name, I just had them put me LOL. That's my own insecurities, okay? My own insecurities I'm working through here. The, the, point, the point is this, the point is this. The gospel is not just about Jesus making a way for you to spend an eternity with him. It is most certainly that, and my goodness, if that's all it was, we would have enough to rejoice in and to celebrate in, but it is also more than that. It's the story of how Jesus, through self-sacrificial love, became king of the world, defeated sin and death, and how you're now invited by his grace to be a part of what he is doing. Do you see how this understanding changes things? When we understand the gospel in this way, then we don't have room to simply just believe and not follow. We don't have room to just believe and not be a disciple. There is no room to just believe a certain set of doctrinal statements. Our doctrine is important, what we believe is important, but, but our belief has to lead to right living. This is the gospel. And so the next couple of weeks, we're gonna really look at like the practical implications of a lot of this. But for this week, here's kind of the practice for us. You know, as a dad, there's, there's certain things that uh, I want my kids to only have to learn one time, right? Like I hope that Ezra has learned to not run into the corner of the wall while playing football in the living room because she did that at the beginning of this year, 10 hours in the ER getting her face stitched up. It was not fun. I hope she's learned that one time. I hope Piper has learned one time that sneak eating all of your Halloween candy when no one is around is not a good idea, right? I hope that's something she has to learn once. But man, there's, there's also so many things that I want my kids to learn over and over and over and over again. I want them to learn every day 
how much their mom and dad loves them. I want them to learn every day how much God loves them and the incredible plans and purposes that he has for their life. I want them to learn over and over again the value of friendships and the value of hard work. There's a lot of things I want them to learn over and over and over again. And here's where I think we, we are guilty when it comes to the gospel. We think that the gospel is something we only need once. That, that we are pre- the gospel is preached to us so that we can be saved. And once we, are, once we are a follower of Jesus, well, we get to graduate into the deeper things of God. But my goodness, that could not be further from the truth. The gospel is everything. And we need to establish a regular practice of preaching the gospel to ourselves on a daily basis. And that's my challenge to you. This week as you're driving in your car, as you're going from place to place, as you're going from one appointment to another, as you're waiting to pick up your kids from some summer t-ball camp or whatever, let your mind wander to the cross. Let, Let your thoughts wander to the, what it would have been like to be in the garden when Jesus rose from that grave. Let let your thoughts begin to wonder and to think about all the incredible things that God has invited you into and the life and the joy and the purpose that he wants you to experience today. Let's preach the gospel to ourselves every single day. And some of you might be like, "What, man, like this is Father's Day. I thought we were gonna get like a Father's Day message. This is a Father's Day message. Because I don't know if there's anything that a dad needs more than to us to embrace a regular practice of preaching the gospel to himself. Because the gospel is the greatest reminder that Jesus is the king of your household, not you. It's the greatest encouragement that that Jesus makes up the space where you fall short as a dad, and you're gonna fall short as a dad. It's the greatest challenge, and dads, we need to be challenged. It is the greatest challenge for us to view our work and to view our investment in our kids and in our family, not just as things that we do, but this is kingdom work. This is the, our, us contributing to the kingdom of God. Pastor Adam even said it in that video, your greatest contribution to the kingdom of God may not be what you do, but who you raise. And that is not just for dads with biological kids. That is for every spiritual father in the room that is is investing in other people and making difference in the lives of the next generation. This is kingdom work that we're invited into, dads. So let's embrace that. And this isn't, again, this isn't just for dads, this is for everybody. Let's preach the gospel to ourselves. Let's remind ourselves of the goodness of God, of the grace of God, of the mercy of God. Let's remind ourselves of the life that Jesus has invited us into the life and the purpose and the joy that he has for us. Let's let's preach the gospel to ourselves and allow it to transform the way that we live. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word today. Thank you, God, for man, just your grace towards us. God, I thank you for the grace that you give us when we fall short and when we make mistakes and when we fall short of the standard that you have for us. God, I pray for every dad in this room that maybe walked in here feeling guilty and shameful because they just feel like they've fallen short in so many different ways as a dad. And Lord, I pray today would be a day that you replace their guilt and their shame with your grace and your love and your mercy and just a a re- a renewal of the passion and the purpose that you have given them. God, I pray for every person that's here today struggling on this Father's Day because it's a difficult day. I pray, God, that you would be near to them as our Heavenly Father, that you would give them grace for today, give them strength for today. Help them to trust that you are with them. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you're not following Jesus, and I hope you understand how much your Heavenly Father loves you, Following Jesus is not about following a certain set of rules and it's not about a certain set of beliefs. It is, it is about surrendering your life to the way of Jesus. And, and it's not about following that way perfectly either because you're not going to. But, but it's as you go, you understand that God's grace is bigger than your sin and than your mistakes and the ways that you fall short. And if you're here today and you're not following Jesus, but you want to, 
You want to ask him to forgive you of your sin and surrender to him as the king and Lord of your life. Would you lift your hand in the air right where you're at? I'd love the opportunity to pray with you today. You want to surrender your life to Jesus. Thank you so much. Amen. Anybody else, you want to surrender your life to Jesus? Can we pray this prayer together as a family? Say, Jesus, I love you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Today I trust you. I give you my life. I surrender all that I am. And I choose to follow you. I repent and believe because of your love for me. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for jumping on our YouTube page today. Uh, my name is Adam, this is my wife, Christy. We pastor here at Victory Family Church. We talk about family a lot, and we just wanna say uh, welcome to our family. Even if you're online, you are still a part of our family. We'd love for you to subscribe uh, to the YouTube channel and stay in touch with us. Uh, hopefully, the content here will help challenge you, encourage you, grow in your relationship with the Lord and maybe even make you laugh a little bit along the way. So love you, grateful for you. Thanks for joining us.